You're listening to the expository preaching ministry of Kootenai Community Church, located in Kootenai, Idaho. We pray that Christ is exalted and your spirit is blessed by the teaching of God's Word. For more information about Kootenai Church, please visit us online at kootenaichurch.org. Merry Christmas, which translated means blessed reminder of the birth of the Savior. Let's pray. Father, we should celebrate the birth, the life, the death, and the resurrection of the Savior every day. But this is a time of year when everyone is turned towards that. And so, I, Lord, I pray that we would capitalize on that. But as we gather together this morning, we would first acknowledge your sovereignty over life and we would thank you for your word and for its impact in our lives. We pray, Lord, that as we study this morning, it would draw us even closer to you, love you even more, and want to serve you even more fervently. And we'll thank you for what you're going to do in Jesus' name. Amen. So we are in 1 Corinthians 14. And last week I read 1 Corinthians 13, so I think this week we're going to read Galatians 3. Just for giggles. We'll read 1 Corinthians 14 about the first, I don't know how far we'll get today, but we'll go to chapter, I mean, to, to verse 25. 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Are we still on? This thing fell off. There, is that better? Yeah. If I was in my pocket, you would have heard me. <clears throat> Pursue love, yet desire earnestly spiritual gifts. 1 Corinthians 14. But especially that you may prophesy, for one who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God. For no one understands, but in his spirit he speaks mysteries. But one who prophesies speaks to men for edification and exhortation and consolation. One who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but one who prophesies edifies the church. Now, I wish that you all spoke in tongues, but even more that you would prophesy. And there's something happened. But even more that you would prophesy. <clears throat> and greater is one who prophesies than one who speaks in tongues, unless he interprets so that the church may receive edifying. But now, brethren, if I come to you speaking in tongues, what shall I profit you unless I speak to you either by way of revelation or of knowledge or of, a pro or of prophecy or of teaching? Yet even lifeless things, either flute or harp, in producing a sound, if they do not produce a distinction in the tones, how will it be known what is played on the flute or on the harp? For if the bugle produces an indistinct sound, who will prepare himself for battle? So also, you, unless you utter by the tongue speech that is clear, how will it be known what is spoken? For you will be speaking into the air. There are perhaps a great many kinds of languages in the world, and no kind is without meaning. If then I do not know the meaning of the language, I shall be to the one who speaks a barbarian, and the one who speaks will be a barbarian to me. So also you, since you are zealous of spiritual gifts, seek to abound for the edification of the church. Therefore, let one who speaks in a tongue pray that he may interpret. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. What is the outcome then? I shall pray with the spirit, and I shall pray with the mind. Also, I shall sing with the spirit, and I shall sing with the mind also. Otherwise, if you bless in the spirit only, how will the one who fills the place of the ungifted say the amen? At your giving of thanks, since he does not know what you are saying. For you are giving thanks well enough, but the other... The other man is not edified. <clears throat> Thank God I speak in tongues more than you all. However, in the church I desire to speak five words with my mind that I may instruct others also rather than 10,000 words in a tongue. Brethren, do not be children in your thinking, yet in evil be babes, but in your thinking be mature. In the law is written by men of strange tongues and by the lips of strangers I will speak to this people, and even so they will not listen to me, says the Lord. So then... Tongues are for a sign, not to those who believe, but to unbelievers. But prophecy is for a sign, not to unbelievers, but to those who believe. If therefore the whole church should assemble together and all speak in tongues, and ungifted men or unbelievers enter, will they not say that you are mad? But if all prophesy, and an unbeliever or an ungifted man enters, he is convicted by all, he is called to account by all, the secrets of his heart are disclosed, and so he will fall on his face and worship God, declaring that God is certainly among you. So last week we finished on, uh, I believe we were on chapter 12, chapter 14, verse, verse 11. 
But there was a question that came up about verse 4, and I believe Jim handled it just fine, but I thought we, I would like to revisit it a little bit um, regarding the, the concept of Paul speaking sarcastically. So, one who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, Paul says, through the Holy Spirit, but the one who prophesies edifies the church. Paul does not deny the fact that tongues have a value and, and, and edifying, in edifying, but only the one speaking commu and communing with God. The loving thing to do, however, is to speak and to live in a manner that will edify the entire body. This is what prophecy or foretelling does. And for those of you that haven't been here, when we talk about prophecy in the modern church, we're talking about expositing the word of God, not predicting the future. That was for uh, a time of the apostles. There was three times in history that prophecy was very important and was used to authenticate the messengers of God. We now have the self-authenticating word of God. Prophecy will come again where foretelling will happen. But for our purposes today in the church, prophecy is the clear exposition of the word of God. It's forth telling. It's actually what most of prophecy was even in the Old Testament times. It was prophets calling kings to account. The word of God says this, you're doing this, knock it off. That was basically what prophets did. And they got thrown in prison often. So, so the point here in verse 4 is not to be found in determining whether tongues is appropriate or not, but rather that love dictates that one would do things that bless and benefit others not just oneself. Tongues has self-edification value only, but prophecy edifies the entire body. What cannot be understood cannot be expected to help others. So in this verse, as Jim mentioned last week, uh, Paul is using sarcasm. He uses it in chapter 4, verses 8 through 10, and he applies it again in verse 16 of this chapter. Sarcasm is not uncommon for Paul. He uses it on the Judaizers in Galatians, Galatians chapter 5, verse 12, where he says, I wish that those troubling you would even mutilate themselves. Talking about the way they were f requiring that the believers there had to be circumcised in order to actually be believers. And he was saying, go all the way, cut it off, you idiots. That's basically what he was saying. He was being, that was hyperbole and it was sarcasm. The Lord Jesus himself used sarcasm in Matthew chapter 23. You blind guides who strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. He was pointing out their, their hypocrisy at their philosophies. And then Paul has repeatedly in this epistle and others reminded the Corinthians that the gifts are specifically to be used in service to others, not to be used for self-gratification or edification or to um, grant to give you notoriety or fame. That's not what, that's not what believers are supposed to do. Our, our, our design, if you will, is to serve one another, not to serve ourselves. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7, Paul says, But to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. 1 Corinthians 14, 5. Now I wish that all spoke in tongues, but even more that you would prophesy, and greater is the one who prophesies than one who speaks in tongues unless he interprets, so that the church may receive edifying. 1 Corinthians 14, 12. So also you, since you are zealous of spiritual gifts, seek to abound for the edification of the church. Ephesians 4, 11 and 12. And he gave some as apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists, some as pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of service, for the building up of the body of Christ. You evil thing. To the building up of the body of Christ. And 1 Peter 4, 10 and 11. As each one has received a special gift, employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Whoever speaks is to do as one who is speaking the utterance of God. Whoever serves is to do as one who is serving by the strength which God supplies, so that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belongs the glory and dominion forever and amen. With this in mind, it is clear that Paul, Jesus, and the other apostles, and I should have put Jesus first, it is clear that Jesus... Then Paul and the other apostles all intended to convey to their listeners, to the church, to the, to the people they were writing to, to the people they were speaking to, that the gifts of the Holy Spirit are to be employed in the services of a service of others for the building up of the church and for the edifying of the saints. It is with this in mind 
that when Paul wrote verse 4 as well as others, that the Corinthians should be recognizing that he is sarcastically reminding them that they are doing something to edify themselves. It is not scriptural, it is not edifying, and it is selfish. All of these are anathema to Christianity. And so as Jim pointed out last week, the sarcasm was intended to convey to them, yeah, go ahead. Verse 4, he, he says, you ever notice when you're trying to get to a page in a hurry, it takes you four days to get there, yeah? He says, the one who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but the one who prophesies edifies the church. And that is the point of the gifts, to build up others to bring others along, to instruct, to encourage, and edify. Are there any other questions about verse 4 before we move on? Okay. So now we, were, we, were, we finished off at verse 11. <clears throat> if then I do not know the meaning of the language. Paul was talking about those who were speaking tongues in the church. I will be to the one who speaks, a barbarian, rude, rough, harsh, strange, um, actually... The, the Greeks use the word barbarian the, much the way we would say um, subhuman. They thought people other than them were subhuman. <laughs> they were a bit, a bit uh, self-righteous. I will be to the one who speaks a barbarian, and the one who speaks will be a barbarian to me. So then Paul goes on to this in verse, tw uh, verse 12. He says, so also you speaking to the Corinthians, since you are zealous of spiritual gifts, seek to abound for the edification of the church. He keeps pounding on this idea that the gifts are for, are for others. They're not for me. They're not for me to become famous. They're not for me to become better or more important. They're to be used in the employ of the service of others. Paul acknowledges the impassioned desire of the Corinthians to excel in the area of spiritual gifts. He counsels them to, and the word means to superabound, for that's the translation of the Greek word for abound, for the building up of the entire body, the entire church body. <clears throat> the Corinthians had to be chastised and encouraged to think outside the box, if you will, and the box was their own special little place where they became famous and important. The first occurrence of the gift of tongues at Pentecost is the pattern. As the apostle spoke, God used this gift to make certain that every person there, no matter their language, would not be as a barbarian to those speaking, but would rather be a potential brother in Christ and would be able to understand the message that was being preached, would be able to understand the message of the gospel. This is Paul's desire for all the Corinthians. Every time you're going to use this gift, in the time that it is available, he told the Corinthians, make sure that it is understandable and a blessing to the entire body assembled where the gift is used. So he wanted those who were going to speak in tongues to do it in such a manner that it would be a blessing not just to the speaker, but to the entire body. And what would that require? Interpretation. It would require interpretation. So what that would mean, a spiritual person who was about to speak in tongues knowing and there was no interpreter, he would shut up. He would stop until there was interpretation because it would not be a benefit to anybody but himself. So, verse 13, Therefore, let one who speaks in a tongue pray that he may interpret. Paul does not counsel the Corinthians to abandon the gift, for at this time in history, it certainly had its uses. In keeping with the idea that Paul has been expounding that the gifts are available and, are, and a Christian, the Christian should desire the more edifying ones, Paul counsels those who have this gift to ask if they can also have the gift of interpretation or someone present can interpret so that their speech will be useful and edifying to the entire body and not to just themselves. Not decrying the gift of tongues, but pointing it in the direction of the most effective service. That's what Paul's doing. If you're going to speak, make sure you can interpret or someone else can interpret. There needs to be interpretation. Any questions about that? Comments? Nathal? Then they should have stopped speaking. Actually, today, the tongues, tongues is not for today. But let's assume it was. Let's assume we transport ourselves back 
2,000 years, and this person begins breaking forth in an ecstatic speech. If there's no interpretation, by the Holy Spirit, they should stop speaking. They should know enough. Paul has taught them, if there's no one to interpret, you're only edifying yourself. The gifts were given to edify the body. Shut up. I was trying to be gracious. <laughs> I'm on tape. <laughs> it's, it, it was not of the Holy Spirit. I'm sorry. Or no, I'm actually not sorry, because the Word of God says that. Yeah. It, it, you know, in a situation like that, it's, it's difficult. I went to, I, I, when I first got married, we were married in a charismatic church. Wonderful people. Don't misunderstand me. They were believers. They had this wrong. They just had this wrong. And I actually had the pastor preach at me one time. He pointed at it. It was, it was not very comfortable. I was a really young man at the time. And, and he was telling me that I was a jerk, basically, in holy language. And uh, Well, that would be the only thing you could do. Um, I would caution you to go on feelings, but I understand what you're saying. Yeah. yeah. The Word of God counsels that if so there was no interpreter, transporting ourselves back 2,000 years, if there was no interpreter, this was a useless babbling. So transporting ourselves today, where tongues was a sign gift and useful for authenticating the message at the time, and then it, it, the Scripture says that it, it ceased of its own self in, that, in uh, 1 Corinthians 14. It's not for today. And so, unfortunately, when folks are doing that, it's not from the Holy Spirit. Pedro. Unfruitful. We are going to get to that. Right. Right. If, if you're not able to understand what you're babbling, then all that's going to be attending that would be feelings. And your mind is not engaged. And when the mind is not engaged, that's a very dangerous thing. So we're going to actually get to that, but thank you. So any other comments about um, verse 13? If you're going to speak in a tongue back then, pray that there be interpretation. Yes. It would have been a foreign language. It would not have been babbling. Babbling was the mystery religions. So a, a proper use of the tongues in a setting like today. Here we are. Let's say there are, I think Justin brought it up last week, there's somebody in here who doesn't understand English. Someone would get up in order, not shouting. One of the other things that was going on in the Corinthian church is it was just they were shouting over one another and they were falling over one another. It was so disarray, so much disarray. Paul called it chaos, and he said God is not a God of chaos, he's a God of order, but we'll get to that too. So a man or a woman or someone would have stood up and began speaking in the language that other people were wishing they could understand the speaker in, and someone else would have immediately began interpreting that. And it would have been, have you ever watched a, um, I, I don't know that this would be exactly what it would be like, but a film of when they're speaking it like of the United Nations, which shouldn't exist, but that's another story. Um, <laughs> we, we gave them eight billion last year, which was nine billion too much. Um, so there would be people in booths who understand the language of the person and they would be translated and that was going into the earpieces of everyone who spoke the other language so that they could understand what was going on. Otherwise, that speaker is useless to two-thirds of the people in the room. Yes, Brian. Mm-hmm. 
And, and out of his mouth came the people heard in their language what Peter was saying. It was a language known to people. It wasn't babbling. It was, it was Persian. It was Armenian it, or Aramaic, excuse me. <laughs> that was a slip of the tongue. It was Aramaic. It was Greek. It was probably Hebrew. It was probably, uh, at that time, maybe Latin. Um, people would have been hearing the, the preaching that Peter was, was offering the gospel, and it was a really good sermon. You didn't want to miss any of it. They all heard it in their own language. That was a proper use, but uh, that was self-interpreted by the Holy Spirit. In, in a setting like this, it would be someone standing up for the benefit of people who didn't understand the language, not just for some babbling that would make someone feel good about what they were saying, for the benefit of other people in the body, because that's what Paul continually pounds home. This is a gift for edification of the whole body. And if you knew that when Jim was preaching this morning, in Hebrews, and it was good, and you were enjoying it, but you knew someone was sitting in the back room, I'm transporting us back 2,000 years again, uh, who couldn't understand it. Wouldn't you be grateful if someone said, here's what he's saying? And that person got the benefit of the message as well. And that's what we should be about. Everybody should be benefiting. We should be doing what we can to bless the church, the body, the ecclesia, the called out ones, all of them that are, that are under our ministry, in our ministry. So then in verse 14, Paul says, Now, if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. As a Christian, in those times would pray in a tongue that they had not learned, there being no interpretation, only their spirit would be engaged while their mind would not. This harks back to verse 9 where Paul said that to do such a thing would be like speaking into the air to no effect. This activity would have no benefit to the church because communication from God to us is from my, his mind to our mind. This is how the word of God works. Paul did not want Corinthian Christians nor us to be about the business of edifying only ourselves and engaging in what could become pointless spiritual exercises. This is what the misuse of this gift was producing, and this is what Paul was speaking against. Engage your mind. Stop this ecstatic nonsense that is a, is a feature of the mystery religions. This is what the mystery religions were doing at the time. They would babble. Someone would get up and babble, and the others would assume, wow. He's speaking in a God language to the God. He's really somebody or she's really somebody. And that's what it was about. And he, <laughs> boy, when we, when we blow our own horn, it's a sour tune. It's just noise. It's a, anyway. So he says, if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. Do you think he likes the idea that the mind is unfruitful? He's going to comment on that. What is the outcome then? He says in verse 15, if I, I will pray with the spirit and I will pray with the mind also. I will engage my mind also. I will sing with the spirit and I will sing with the mind also. I've got to be really careful here. Paul did not want the Corinthians to be involved in mindless, ecstatic prayer. If they were going to pray with their spirit, they must engage their mind as well. If they were going to sing with their spirit, then they needed to sing with their mind as well. There are songs that move you. The, the music moves you, doesn't it? The words move you, but you understand what they're saying. You know what's going on. They communicate a message to you that puts maybe puts the puts the beauty of what Christ did on the cross and in the resurrection in clearer perspective for you. And you're, you're, you've engaged your spirit because you're delighted and you're happy and, and you're joyful, but you've also engaged your mind. You understand something better. Once in a while you watch somebody and you see this little light bulb go on over their head. And you go, oh, they got it. <laughs> My light bulb doesn't go on very, it's, it's an LED bulb. It doesn't shine very bright, but you know. So, they wanted, he wanted them to engage their mind. If they were going to sing with their spirit, they needed to sing with their mind. This would only be the only acceptable outcome, Paul says. While spirituality involves more than the mind, it never ex excludes the mind. I am not saying that you cannot be moved in your spirit, in your soul, to the very depths of your soul, where tears come to your eyes from a song or from a preaching. But what I am saying is that your mind will be engaged. If you disengage your mind, you open yourself up to all kinds of dangers. And this is what was happening to the Corinthians. Romans 12, 1 and 2. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, 
to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable God to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove, so that you may live out, so that you may demonstrate to others that the will of God is good and acceptable and perfect every time. I'm getting excited. I'm sorry. Further, Jesus himself said he commanded us to love God with everything we have. He said in Matthew chapter 22, verse 36 through 38. There's Romans 12, 1 and 2. It's kind of like uh, slow motion. Okay, we'll get to that in a minute here. Here's what Jesus said. A man come up to it, came up to him and said, Teacher, what is the great commandment on the law? And Jesus said to him, and he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. Notice that the commandment is to love God with all three components of our humanity, our heart, our soul, and our mind. This loving of God cannot be done by each component individually. It must be done as a unit. We love him with our will, with our affections, and with our understanding. None of these can be divorced from the other, and this love must permeate every area of our life. We are to love God in our activities. We're to love him in our work. We're to love him in our play. We're to love him in every area of our lives such that we live our lives in a way that will please him. This is the active, directed love that is called in the Greek agape. But our minds must be completely involved. This is not a sappy, squishy kind of love, but a genuine, directed devotion that supersedes everything else in our lives. It will necessarily affect the way we live. It will affect the way we worship. It will affect the way we interact with each other. Uh, Leon Morris, in his commentary, said this. Up till this point, Paul has concentrated on the value of the gifts to people other than those who exercise them. Now he looks within. With anyone who prays in a tongue is not using his mind. Greek news. The Christian life is considerably more than a mental exercise, but anyone whose mind is unfruitful is not being true to his Christian calling. This passage is very important for its insistence on the rightful place of the intellect. Notice that this is secured without any diminution of spiritual fervor. Paul is not arguing for barren intellectualism. There is a place for the enthusiasm so strikingly exemplified in the use of tongues, but it must be allied to the use of the mind. And this tongues by itself, this tongues by itself does not provide. Paul singles out two activities specific, especially appropriate in public worship, prayer and singing. Both must be done intelligently with the mind. Sing properly means sing to the accompaniment of a, a, a musical instrument. But here it is used quite generally. And uh, clearly Paul is not looking for unintelligible prayers, prayers in a ritual emotional jargon, or hymns chosen on the basis of attractive tunes without regard to the theology they express. The mind is to be active in both. And so that's why we need to be careful in the music we choose to worship God. Uh, you've all heard of 7-Eleven music. Seven words repeated 11 times. Drive-by Christian music. Um, okay, that's as far as I'm going to go. <laughs> what was that? Come on, bring it. Yes. Exactly. Very well said. It's contemplating what the words say, what they mean, how they interplay with each other, what this verse in context means among the other verses that you're reading, and how it extols the glory of God. Every scripture is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction, that the person, the man or woman of God, will be fully equipped to do every work that God has designed for them. And I just mixed 1 Timothy and, and uh, Ephesians. But uh, you'll translate it. Is there someone who would translate that? <laughs> it, this is exciting stuff. This is exciting stuff. God intended for us to be delighted with him. To the, to the point where maybe tears come and you can't even begin to express yourself sometimes. But never to the divorcing of the mind. That's dangerous and it's foolish. Any other questions? 
before I get carried away on something else. Go ahead. By concentrating on what the Word of God says. Again, I, when, we, when we use our mind to control our spiritual worship, we do it in such a manner that we use God's Word to control it. Not just what we think, not just what feels at the time. But that means that you're... Uh, have you often found yourself reading something that was really exciting and something else came to mind and you went back and you searched around until you found that too? That's part of what it is. It's, it's, it's someone who has spent the time in the Word of God that they have... Uh, a connection in their minds to other parts that relate to one another. So like when we're going to be studying the book of Hebrews, that's going to have an in intimate connection to the book of Leviticus, the shadow as opposed to Leviticus as opposed to the substance of Hebrew. So you, it's, the point is, is that your mind controls your spiritual worship. Now that isn't going to say that you're going to, you're, you're, there are going to be times when even though the mind's in control, you're going to find yourself in tears. You're going to find yourself joyful. You're going to find yourself, some folks raise their hands. Now, I don't do that, but the scripture says it's fine. It's okay to do that, <laughs> you know. So some people are going to do that. Their, their mind's going to be engaged. It's going to cause joy. They're going to recognize things, but their mind's going to be in control of what's going on at the given time. Uh, what was happening here, now, by the way, again, tongues was for this time. So transporting ourselves back in time, 2,000 years, this person who, if they were truly under the Spirit's control, they would be looking for an interpreter. That's part of the control of their mind that the Spirit would have given them. They would not just be like the mystery religions, babbling to make noise, to impress other people. They would recognize, oh, I've got something the Lord has given me for this time right now. And there must be, if I do have that, there will be an interpreter because Paul said so, because the Holy Spirit said so. That's where the mind would have been in control of the Spirit, their Spirit, not the Holy Spirit. But the holy, but their spirit, Brian. It's when we, we begin to decide that we have the facility within ourselves to control our, our spiritual worship. We don't, but the Word of God does, and the Holy Spirit does. Yes? Paul didn't say that. The Scripture says it. It says... It hadn't ceased there. In First Cor in Corinthians, it ceased at the end of the apostolic age. Uh, let me see if I can find what verse it is. <laughs> the one I read last week. Even though we were in chapter fourteen. Right. Well, actually, there's an entire teaching that uh, centers around the idea that there are certain sign gifts. Verse, th verse 8, love never fails, but there are gifts of prophecy. They will be done away. That is a, a Greek word that means from the outside, something will do away with it. There will come a time when we will stand before God himself, and we will no longer need either predicting of the future, component of prophecy, or that component of prophecy where people exposit the word of God because we will be standing in front of the word himself. And we can get whatever we need directly from, I, I wanted to say the horse's mouth, but that seems like a horrible way to, from God himself. Some of our metaphors are just not that well established, I think. So if there are gifts of prophecy, they will be done away. Something com will come in from the outside. That's what the Greek word means. It's an active word. They will be done away. If there are tongues, they will cease. That's a passive 
And what that means is, they, the word is actually, if you translate it in the original language, they will love their own selves, cease. So the gifts, the sign gifts, when you look at the three times in history when God used sign gifts to authenticate his messengers, the time in history with, Elijah, uh, with uh, Moses and, jo and Joshua, for about a 65-year period, there was prophecy, there was healings, that there was things that these men did that then disappeared for a period of time. Then along came Elijah and Elisha, and those things appeared again. And what those were for was to authenticate the messenger. They weren't for everyone. They were authenticate the messenger. Now, does that mean that healing can't, God can't heal today? No. But what it means is that he, will not, he has not given today a special gift of healing to individuals. If he had, has, please go in and clean out the hospitals. Get her done, Johnny Reb. You know? He hasn't. There were, those gifts were so that when people saw the apostles grab a man who had been lame from birth and everybody knew the guy didn't walk, his legs were malformed and he said, well, I have not silver or gold, but what I have, stand up and walk in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. They went, I think these guys are real. That's what it was for. And at the end of the apostolic period, the sign gifts, mercy, or uh, mercy, no, mercy me, we need, sign, we need mercy today. Um, healing, Tongues and, uh, oh, help me. I've fallen and I can't get up out of the gift mess. It, well, interpretation. There were three gifts that ceased, the sign gifts. Healing, pro prophetic utterances, and uh, tongues. Those were used to authenticate the time. Once, they, once the time was done and the apostles passed from the scene and the church began to form uh, by the teaching of the apostles, Acts chapter 2, verse 42, those sign gifts were no longer needed. Now, uh, exposition of scripture is still needed. Pastors are still needed. There's a whole, administration is still needed. Those are all still needed. So the Holy Spirit continues to send those into his believers to, uh, to, uh, to benefit and bless the church and build the church on, on, on the earth. But the sign gifts are done. And, it's, and then the third one is knowledge. It will be done away. We won't need, when we're standing before God, he will be our encyclopedia. Right there in our living room, if you will. That's another poor metaphor, but you get, yes. Right, unless you're a politician. Oh, I didn't say that. Okay, was that helpful? Okay. Right. Yeah. And I did go into that. I did give a historical account. It disappeared from the scene. And when you get to people like Origen and Augustine, what, the way they talked about it, they said, well, that was for the time. It's gone now. Uh, Chrysostom, um, Tertullian, they all, some of them never even talked about it, but the few that did mentioned that that's not happening today. That was for the time. And uh, so we see no, no instances of tongues uh, in the church proper until the late 1800s, early 1900s. And then all of a sudden it's back, and it's not real. Not according to Scripture. And you're going to see what the Corinthians were doing is kind of what's happening today in some of the churches. At least the one I went to, it was happening. It was just chaos. It was, it was, I didn't know enough about the scripture at the time to know all the ins and outs of it, but I knew it made me very uncomfortable. <laughs> I would just sit there and go, oh, I hope these people are going to be okay. So verse 16, otherwise, if you bless in the spirit only, how will the one who fills the place of the ungifted, the person who doesn't know the Lord, say the amen at your giving of thanks since he doesn't know what you are saying? Here is another challenge from a different point. If you are speaking in a tongue and you give a blessing, how can someone who hears you be in agreement with your blessing if he doesn't understand what you're saying? The word translated ungifted might be better understood as untrained or unlearned. And I would refer to his inability because of his lack of training or in this case, especially lack of interpretation to understand what you're saying. It is used five times in the New Testament and is translated ungifted three times, untrained once, unskilled once, and in the New American Standard. 
uh, unskilled once in the New American Standard. Indirectly, there is another Pauline prescription of self-edification. Don't edify yourself. He wants those hearing a blessing. He wants them to be able to say, yeah, amen, so be it. So that when someone who's, when uh, the preacher, when the edifier, when the, the, the speaker is saying something that is a blessing, it's a blessing to everyone. Everyone who wants to can say amen because they understood what was said. Uh, by the way, that's the Hebrew word amen or amen means so let it be. Yeah. Uh, I don't know what a modern vernacular would be, and I don't want to belittle it by saying it. But at any rate, the word ungifted, I had that up there. Just a person, a private person as opposed to a magistrate, a ruler, or a king, a common person, a common soldier, uh, properly of one's own self. It's the word, <laughs> it was a good word, but it could also be used as a bad word back then. And today, we generally use this word in a very negative sense. It's a, trans, it's a transliterated word into our language, and the word is idiot. <laughs> so if you called someone an idiot in Greek in first century Corinth, it didn't have the meaning that it does today. Sometimes that's how words migrate in their meaning. But it meant someone who was unlearned, untutored, unskilled, unprofessional. So, I, I want to get to verse 17 so we can kind of tie this up. For you are giving thanks well enough, Paul is saying to the person speaking in tongues, but the other person is not edified. He comes back to it again and again and again. Be there for each other. Serve one another. Give to one another. Take care of one another. Bless one another. <clears throat> the proper use of the gift, including the gift of tongues, would be to, edif to edify the other person. It would, it would be to build up the church and strengthen all rather than minister to oneself. The inner sense that you are doing well and you're giving of thanks is not what should direct how you give thanks. Again, again, it, what should be directed is how you can minister to others in your giving of thanks. Paul is clearly talking about public worship here. So I want to close with this. And, and I see it so well in, in the giving and the blessing that this church takes care of one another. It's an inner motivation of the Spirit by an understanding of the Word of God to take care of one another, to bless one another in whatever you do. And so it's going to stop you from doing things that are not for the benefit of others. And, it's, and, and you, you catch yourself. It's, it's the old saying, if you haven't got something nice to say, don't say anything at all. Or if you can't say something nice, talk about the weather. That's kind of an expression of what that is. It's when you stop yourself by the motivation of the Spirit because of your understanding of the Word of God. You stop yourself from doing things that aren't to the blessing of others, and you work towards doing things that are to the blessing of others. You care about others. You care about others because... Because the Holy Spirit permeates your heart, permeates your life. Now, does that mean you're perfect? Of course not. Of course not. But it does mean that when you don't do those things, what happens? You feel guilty, don't you? You feel like you failed. And you go to God in 1 John 1, 9, and you confess it, and you're forgiven, and you get back up, and you do better next time by the grace of the Holy Spirit, by the grace of God. So it's a motivation. It's a, it's a sub it's an underlying motivation in all that we do to bless one another, to take care of one another, to think first of the other person. That's what Paul's trying to get the Corinthians to do. Because what they're doing, you touch my stuff, I'll sue you. That was the Corinthian way. Oh, but we're tolerant. We'll, we'll, we'll let known pedophiles and, and uh, incest in the church because we're tolerant. No, Paul. <laughs> no, 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 no. You're not taking care of those people when you do that. Sometimes... Blessing and taking care of other people means tough love. But more often than not, it means just shutting up, just slowing down and stopping what you're doing. And so that's what Paul's trying to do here in this, at least one of the things. The, the nice thing about the Scripture is that when you have someone teaching on a section of Scripture, that's just one aspect. The Scripture is so deep and so complete that there's far more here than I'm able to exposit because I don't have the mind of, I, I just don't have it in me. But you can study and God will bring stuff. How, how many times have you studied a section of scripture and you knew that, you knew it inside, you knew it out, up and down and, and a month later somebody preached on it and you went, I never saw that before. I don't know how we did it. 
It's an amazing thing, an amazing thing, but scripture is sufficient. Yes. Yeah, the right, the good ones will say, it's way deeper than me, way deeper than me. And that's a good thing. Let's pray. Father, thank you that you have given us absolutely everything we knew to everything we need to live lives godly in Christ Jesus, that you want us to serve one another and you give us every ability to do that, both by the gifts of the Holy Spirit and by the ministry of the word of God in our lives. We pray, Lord, that we would, in a word, succumb to it every day, that we would be about the business of blessing one another. And as we continue in this season of remembering the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you. We thank you that you sent him into our lives. And we want to give him to those who don't have him. We ask you these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for listening to the latest podcast from Kootenai Church. If you'd like to learn more about Kootenai Church or to donate to our church ministry, you can do so online by visiting KootenyChurch.org. We hope you enjoyed this podcast and pray you'll join us again next time. Once again, thank you for listening.